Chapter 8 of Stand By for Mars. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean O'Hara. Stand By for Mars by Carrie Rockwell. Chapter 8. The campus of Space Academy was quiet that evening. Only a few cadets were still out on the quadrangle, lounging around in the open before returning to their quarters for bed check. On the 42nd floor of the dormitory building, two-thirds of the newly formed Polaris unit were in a heated argument. All right, all right, so the guy's brilliant, said Astro. But who can live with him? Not even himself. Maybe he is a little difficult, replied Tom. But somehow we've got to adjust to him. How about him adjusting to us? It is two against one. Astro shambled to the window and looked out moodily. Besides, he's putting in for a transfer and there's nothing we can do about it. Maybe you won't now. Not after that little speech Captain Strong made this afternoon. If he doesn't, then blast it, I will. Ah, now take it easy, Astro. Take it easy, nothing. Astro is building up a head of steam. Where is that space crawler right now? I don't know. He never came back. Wasn't even down at mess tonight. There, that's just what I mean. Astro turned to Tom and pressed his point. It's close to bed check and he isn't in quarters yet. If the MBs catch him outside after hours, the whole unit will be logged, and there goes our chance of blasting off tomorrow. But there's still time, Astro, replied Tom lamely. Not much there isn't. It just shows you what he thinks of the unit. He doesn't care. Astro paced the floor angrily. There's only one thing to do. He gets his transfer, or we do. Or, he paused and looked at Tom meaningfully, or I do. You're not thinking, Astro, argued Tom. How will that look on your record? Every time there's a trip in deep space, they yank out your files, see how you operate under pressure with other guys. When they see that you ask to be transferred from your unit, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Incompatible. But honest, Tom. The curly-haired cadet felt his big friend weaken, and he pressed his advantage. It isn't every day that a unit gets a ship right after finishing ground manuals. Captain Strong said he waited four months after manuals before getting his first stop into space. Yeah, but what do you think it's going to be like in space with Manning making sour cracks all the time? Tom hesitated before answering his Venusian friend. He was fully aware that Roger was going to play a lone hand, and that they would never really have unity among them unless some drastic measure was taken. After all, Tom thought, some guys don't have good hearts or eyes, a defect to prevent them from becoming spacemen. Roger is just mixed up inside, and the handicap is just as real as if he had a physical flaw. Well, what do you want to do? asked Tom finally. Go see Captain Strong. Give it to him straight. Tell him we want to transfer. But tomorrow we blast off. We might not have another chance for months. Certainly not until we get a new astrogator. I'd rather wait and have a guy on the radar bridge I know isn't going to pull something behind my back, said Astro, and blast off tomorrow with Manning aboard. Again, Tom hesitated. He knew what Astro was saying was the truth. Life so far at the Academy had been tough enough but with mutual dependence and security even more important out in space, the danger of their constant friction was obvious. Okay, he relented. If that's the way you really want it, come on. We'll go see Captain Strong now. You go, said Astro. You know how I feel. Whatever you say goes for me, too. Are you sure you want to do it? asked Tom. He knew what a request would mean. A black mark against Roger for being rejected by his unit mates, and a black mark against Astro and himself for not being able to adjust. Regardless of who was right and who was wrong, there would always be a mark on their records. Look, Tom, said Astro, if I thought it was only me, I'd keep my mouth shut. But you'd let Manning get away with murder, because you wouldn't want to be the one to get him into trouble. No, I wouldn't, said Tom. I think Roger would make a fine spaceman. He's certainly smart enough, and a good unit mate, if he'd only snap out of it. But I can't let him or anyone else stop me from becoming spaceman or a member of the Solar Guard. Then you'll go see Captain Strong? Yes said Tom. If he had been in doubt before, now that he'd made the decision, he felt relieved. He slipped on his space boots and stood up. The two boys looked at each other, each realizing the question in the other's mind. No, said Tom decisively. It's better for everyone, even Roger. He might find two other guys who will fit him better. He walked from the room. The halls were silent as he strode towards the slide stairs that would take him to the 19th floor and Captain Strong's quarters. Passing one room after another, he glanced in and saw other units studying, preparing for bed, or just sitting around talking. There weren't many units left. The tests had taken their tolls on the earthworms. But those that remained were solidly built. Already friendships had taken deep root. Tom found himself wishing he had become a member of another unit. Where the comradeship was taken for granted in other units, he was about to make a request to dissolve his because of friction. Completely discouraged, Tom stepped onto the slide stairs and started down. 
As he left the dormitory floors, the noise of young cadet life was lost in the passing floors containing offices and departments of the administration staff of the Solar Guard. As he drew level with the floor that was the Galaxy Hall, he glanced at the lighted plaque, and for the hundredth time he read the inscription, To the brave men who sacrificed their lives in the conquest of space, the Galaxy Hall is dedicated. Something moved in the darkness of the hall. Tom strained his eyes for a closer look and just managed to distinguish the figure of a cadet standing before the wreckage of the Space Queen. Funny, thought Tom. Why should anyone be wandering around the hall at this time of night? And then, as the floor slipped past, the figure turned slightly and was illuminated by the dim light that came from the slide stairs. Tom recognized the sharp features and close-cropped blonde hair of Roger Manning. Quickly changing over to the slide stairs going up, Tom slipped back to the hall floor and stepped off. Roger was still standing in front of the Space Queen. Tom started to speak, but stopped when he saw Roger take out a handkerchief and dab his eyes. The movements of the other boy were crystal clear to Tom. Roger was crying, standing in front of the Space Queen and crying. He kept watching as Roger put away the handkerchief, saluted sharply, and turned towards the slide stairs. Ducking behind a glass case that held the first spacesuit ever used, Tom held his breath as Roger passed him. He could hear Roger mumble, I got you, but they won't get me with any of that glory stuff. Tom waited heart racing, trying to figure out what Roger meant, and why he was here all alone in Galaxy Hall. Finally, the blonde cadet disappeared up the moving stair. Tom didn't go to see Captain Strong. Instead, he returned to his room. So quick? asked Astro. Tom shook his head. Where's Roger? he asked. In the shower. Astro gestured to the bathroom, where Tom could hear the sound of running water. What made you change your mind about seeing Captain Strong? asked Astro. I think we've misjudged Roger, Astro, said Tom slowly and then related what he'd seen and heard. "'Well, blast my jets!' exclaimed Astro when Tom finished. "'What's behind it, do you think?' "'I don't know, Astro, but I'm convinced that any guy that'll visit Galaxy Hall by himself late at night and cry, well, he couldn't be entirely off-base regardless of what he does.' Astro studied his work-hardened palms. "'You want to keep it this way for a while?' he asked. "'I mean, forget about talking to Captain Strong?' "'Roger's the best astrogator and radar man in the Academy, Astro.' There's something bothering him. I'm willing to bet that whatever it is, Roger will work it out. And if we're really unit mates, then we won't sell him out now, when he may need us the most. That's it, then, said Astro. I'll kill him with kindness. Come on, let's turn in. We've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. The two boys began to prepare for bed. Roger came out of the shower wearing pajamas. All excited, spacemen, he drawled, leaning against the wall, brushing his short hair. About as excited as we can get, Roger, smiled Tom. Yeah, you space-blasting jerk growled Astro good-naturedly. Turn out the lights before I introduce you to my space boot. Roger eyed the two cadets quizzically, puzzled by the strange good humor of both boys. He shrugged his shoulders, flipped out the light, and crawled into bed. But if he could have seen the satisfied smile on Tom Corbett, Roger would have been more puzzled. We'll just kill him with kindness, thought Tom, and fell fast asleep. End of Chapter 8